as we said here, we have influences coming in from the past, and then we have our skills in the present moment. The skills are primarily in the three kinds of fabrication. Bodily, the way you breathe. Verbal, the way you talk to yourself. And then mental, the perceptions you focus on and the feelings you focus on. They're all important. For instance, with the breath, when a strong emotion comes on, you can't just talk yourself out of the emotion. You have to realize that the emotion has hijacked your breath, and you've got to get it back. Because otherwise, you feel like you, the whole emotion is penetrating your whole body, and the voice of reason has very little, little purchase there. So you've got to get the breath back on your side. The perceptions you hold in mind are also important. They're like those subliminal messages they put on TV. They just blip very quickly, but your mind can pick it up. Deeper parts of the mind pick it up, and the, those images can drive you. I think I've told you about the time uh, visiting someone and they were watching, watching a show on Fox, and during the advertisement for the evening or the late night news, there was a big white panel above the head of the heads of the announcers. And they kept flashing, be afraid, be afraid, be afraid. So I mentioned my friend Makash, they're getting awfully blatant now, aren't they? So, oh yeah, that's just Fox. I said, no, did you see the message? His conscious mind didn't see it. But those perceptions can speak to your subconscious mind, and they can worm their way into your attitudes. So you have to be very careful about the perceptions you hold in mind, and it's good to learn new perceptions. This is why the Buddha gives so many similes, stories, analogies, for you to stock your mind with new perceptions. And there's verbal fabrication. And John Lee points this out as being probably the most detrimental if you haven't trained it. The way you talk to yourself, you can ruin your state of mind. You mean a perfectly good condition, perfectly good situation, but you can talk yourself into being miserable. You have to be very careful about how you talk to yourself. Here again, it's good to think of the committee of the mind that not every voice in there is yours, and not every voice in there means you well. You may have picked up voices from people who didn't mean you well, some of them who may have been very close to you. They worm their way in, into your thinking. So it helps to see them as committee voices. And then you can think about having rules of order for your committee. Like They have Robert's rules of order. In the outside world, you have the Buddha's rules of order in your inner conversations. They come down to three. What you tell yourself has to be true, has to be beneficial, and has to be timely. Anything else that doesn't meet with those qualifications, you say, I'm not going to listen to it. Again, it may be shouting in your ears, but at least you have a defense against it. Of course, a lot of the times our perceptions of what's true can be really distorted. So you have to keep checking again and again and again to make sure they are true. This is the difference between truth, the precept against lying, and truth as a perfection. Truth in the precept of lying is as long as you think what you say is true, then it's okay. You don't break the precept. But in the perfection of truth, you really have to find what, what it really is true. So you have to figure out how to test it. As I say, don't believe everything you th think is true. Put a little question mark next to it. But if there's something you're 100% convinced is true, then the next step is it beneficial? There's so much written about the inner critic. Now we have to get rid of our inner critic. But that's not the case. We have to learn how to train the inner critic. So what has to say is beneficial, because criticism can be helpful. That's how people learn. But it has to be intended to be helpful. What's the purpose? You have to ask these voices, what is your intention? Because sometimes a voice will come in and it'll sound like Dharma, and it'll get really hard on you. 
make it sound like it's impossible for you to practice, you might as well give up. Well, that's not a compassionate intention. You want a critic that means you well. So again, it's good to sort through the voices in your mind and identify where you've picked up certain attitudes. And do the people really mean you well? And then you look at the criticism itself. Is this helpful? Does this show where there are areas that I can improve and it has helped come up with ideas about how I can carry through with that improvement? That's the second test, the second rule of order. Finally, the third one is has to be timely. In other words, there are times when you need to be soothed, other times when you need to be criticized. Because there are times when the mind is just not ready to take certain criticism or has to take it sugar-coated. We see this with other people. Well, it's the same with ourselves. There are times when you need to learn how to present criticism to yourself in a well-meaning way, in a gentle way. And also point out the good things you're doing. So many people have an inner commentator that doesn't want to comment on what you've done well, is always looking for what you've done wrong. But think of the inner commentator that the Buddha taught to Rahula. This action that I'm about to do, what are the consequences going to be while you're doing it? This action that I'm doing, what are the consequences that are coming up? What's this done? This action that I've done, what were the long-term consequences? And if you see that it was harmful, then you note that it was harmful, that it was a mistake, and then you go talk it over with someone else who's more advanced on the path. That way you get a better attitude on how you can critique what you did, get some good ideas for improvement. If you see, though, that the action did not cause any harm, then you take joy in that fact. You notice in the phrasing there, this action that I am about to do, that I am doing, that I have done. There's I, I, I in there. Sometimes we're told that if you have the idea that you are doing the practice, that's wrong view. In that case, the Buddha had a wrong view, because he's suggesting you use that sense of I to point out that you are responsible, you are an agent. And sometimes it's good to stop and take some joy in the fact that you do have agency, you can make a difference. And you're happy to make a difference, and you're happy to make a good difference. And so when you've done something well, note that fact and have some joy in the practice that you are improving. So there are times when you need to be focusing on the good things, the things that are pleasant. That's the right time and place for that. There are other times, of course, when you've done something wrong. But here again, noting that you've done something wrong has to be done under compassion because you want to do things right and you want to be harmless to yourself and to others. So when your conversations inside follow the Buddha's rules of order, you're listening to what's true, what's beneficial, and what's pleasant and unpleasant comes at the right time. That kind of conversation can make light of bad situations and keep good situations from going sour. Because we do have this power within ourselves. We do have this agency to shape things here in the present moment, how we are processing the information that's coming in through the senses, i.e. how we're processing the results of our past actions. So learn to talk to yourself in a way that makes that agency worthwhile, makes it helpful so that you can continue to take joy in the fact that you can make a difference. And the difference can be really good.